is Deborah Pat. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist and an executive vice president of Texas Oncology in Austin, Texas. Welcome to Medscape Oncology Insights. Joining me today is Dr. Ethan Bosch, director of the Cancer Outcomes Research Program and a professor of medicine and public health at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Limburger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Today we're talking about prior authorization and some of the financial toxicities that accompany cancer treatment. It's, uh, sorry, I'll try that again. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Deborah. Thanks for joining me. So, Ethan, uh, I know that you appreciate the increase in financial toxicity that we have today as patients manage costs, and that's brought a lot of burdens to the clinic. One of those burdens um, is utilization management, which I think we all agree is a really important tool to try to manage costs, especially around cancer care but it's brought some burdens to the clinic as well. I saw the AMA recently did a survey of physicians reporting some of the challenges with prior authorizations and said that about 91% of physicians thought that prior authorizations led to delays in patient care, 26% um, uh, of the time that it led to a serious adverse event, about 75% of time contributed to patient, patient treatment abandonment, and that the prior authorization burden has increased over time, that about 86% of physicians felt like it has increased in the last five years and was high or extremely high burden to their practice. Um, I know in my clinic, I've seen that. We went from giving chemotherapy the next day, five years ago, to now a week from now as we manage prior authorization and our staffing requirements have tripled. Um, do you have any, um, you know, what's your sense of how prior authorization has changed in your environment? Yeah, I would say first speaking from, from experience in our clinic and we, uh, we're in an, in an academic setting, which is a little bit different uh, from a community setting, yet um, the barriers and challenges we face, I, th I think are the same. And I would completely agree. Uh, first on the staffing side, we've seen a, a tremendous swelling of the staffing that we've needed both for prior authorization, but also around the other issue that you alluded to, which is working out the finances, particularly for, for oral um, oncology drugs. Um, I think the second is that the complexity of the process for prior authorization has increased, and there's a fair amount of heterogeneity from payer to payer, so that it's it's uh, the path is different uh, depending on what the insurance situation of the patient is. So this is challenging. Um, I'll say um, in Texas where I practice, um, they have a universal prior authorization requirement. But as you know, insurance is governed by ERISA under federal policy and state policy covers non-ERISA plans. So that's around less than 20% of the patients that we see. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority, to your point, have variable prior authorization documentation. And it makes managing the complexity of that environment very challenging. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, what we found in our practice is that some of the issues can be managed by non-clinicians, uh, but sometimes it's unclear when a clinician needs to be involved and whether a physician or a nurse can uh, will, will be satisfactory. Uh, I think the other problem that we've encountered is that in terms of the, the workflow, how the information is uh, actually conveyed or how the appointments are set up is variable even within a single payer. And so this has created um, a real challenge for the flow of how we, how we manage the, the process. And what we found is we, we have had to have dedicated individuals who are essentially project managing all of us right. uh, to figure out who's doing what and when and to make sure that we don't lose threads. So I think that's a staffing problem for all of us. Um, I'll say within our health record, because we use a clinical decision support tool for most of our pathways uh, as we think about therapeutic interventions for cancer, uh, a lot of the structured elements that you think about as the, the justification for medically necessary care are populated in that tool, and so they're readily available. Um, the challenge is, though, that um, when you give that information to payers, especially in peer-to-peer -peer review, people might not always know exactly what information they need, or they might not always know when they're gonna be able to speak to someone, 
or there may not be timeliness in um, a payer getting back to you around peer-to-peer -peer review. So that's challenging. So I thought we could maybe talk about some tips about how uh, clinics can manage prior authorization better. Yeah, um, I, and, li I like those tips. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, and how to navigate peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Um, so, you know, I think that Prior authorization, like all utilization management, is well intended to provide high value care and it's not going away, it's important, but it needs to be manageable. So I think things to do to make it more manageable are to make sure that you have the necessary information for justification of medically necessary treatment. And things that help with that are things like guidelines. Frequently in my dictations, I say, as per guidelines, this is the therapy that I'm prescribing or this is the radiology treat this is the radiology study I'm ordering so that way if I have a staff member managing initial prior authorization that's kind of readily available Another thing that, um, that I think is helpful is trying to manage that peer-to-peer -peer conversation better. Um, I find it challenging, especially because I'm out of clinic a lot, like you are, um, that that call might come back three or four days later when I'm not in clinic. So giving my staff the appropriate medical justification for what I'm doing and making sure that documentation is really clear can be helpful to negotiate those peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Those are great tips and I completely agree. And I, I think I, I would probably give the same ones. Um, in addition to the guidelines, what I've found is um, having the applicable primary paper uh, for a given situation can be very helpful, especially if a guideline is not entirely um, entirely clear or it's difficult to cite it. Um, we've actually created macros within our EHR system. We happen to use Epic that you can drop in with what we call dot phrases for a particular situation where it brings in the, the citation. That's and great. that way it's embedded within, uh, within the patient record. And then you know, we can access our EHR remotely on a, on a portable device so that when that call comes in a few days later and you may be off site, you, know, you, you can come back to it. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, I, I think that it really is a challenge to have the appropriate citation or evidence at your fingertips. So I think that's a really good tip. And actually to help that problem, there is a pilot that we have with one of our practices and one payer of an electronic interface, which is ideal. And in, mm -hmm. in my opinion, that should be everyone's solution. But until we get there, I think having that evidence clearly documented is one thing that helps. I think another thing that's helpful in the peer-to-peer -peer conversation, recognizing that unfortunately, sometimes we don't talk to physicians or we don't talk to physicians that are in our subspecialty. You know, it may be a retired gynecologist that we speak with. Yes. That's challenging because they don't always understand the intricacies of cancer care as their core medical background. Um, and so providing that literature to them can be really helpful. Um, it also, I think, is helpful if they do decide that they're going to decline um, uh, any kind of appeals process, that they have to be transparent about what the appeals process is um, uh, if you disagree with their medical determination. Um, and so providing clarity in that respect can also be helpful. Yes, I completely agree with that. Now, as we um, manage prior authorization, we know financial toxicity is still an issue. Um, uh, frequently, we have patients that have under insurance or no insurance and have to manage their co-payment and out-of-pocket costs, especially for the oral oncolytics, which have grown in, in importance in, in cancer care. Do you want to talk a little bit about how we manage getting payment assistance for our patients? Absolutely. So uh, just as we both alluded to uh, staffing up to support prior authorization, I think many of our practices have had to also staff up to provide financial counseling for our patients. I think that this has been for a twofold reason. Uh, first is because it's, it's become essential to figure out uh, mechanisms to help with the out-of-pocket uh, portion of payment, particularly for the outpatient drugs for patients, but also because it assists with collections. Uh, so there's actually a financial upside for, you know, for the clinic or, or the hospital system. Um, these individuals need to have an understanding of all of the different mechanisms, whether it's manufacturer's assistance or various charities. They have to understand uh, what is allowable with uh, public payers versus private payers. Um, and then they have to be able to track the process over time. We 
have done some analyses of the pathway and the amount of messaging traffic for any given patient. And on average, there are about 15 different communications, usually you know, over multiple days between different individuals coordinating the different kinds of input that are necessary. Uh, much of this we've moved over onto the pharmacy side. Initially, it was uh, being done by non-providers. Then it was being done by our nurse navigators. Uh, but now it's entirely been moved into our specialty pharmacy, and it's been extremely effective. Uh, and we've seen uh, both a decrease in the delay to initiation of treatment, a very substantial one. We've seen uh, more than a two-week improvement in the time to initiating therapy. So now we have, on average, about a one-week time frame from That's prescription to, to shipment of drug from the specialty pharmacy when they use our specialty pharmacy. Uh, but we've also seen a substantial decrease in the patient out-of-pocket obligation. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's challenging to manage this. And so we actually have all of our patients meet with financial counselors to understand their, their burden. Um, and then how they navigate that um, patient assistance landscape is so challenging. Yeah. Um, we too centralize prior auth for oral oncolytics, which today, since they represent about 30% of our treatments, yeah. are growing in importance and patients need to navigate that environment better because usually their out-of-pocket expense is much higher. So um, we have social workers in our clinics that are helping to manage some of those prior auth landscapes. But for clinics that don't have social workers, because there are many, thankfully there are some patient support organizations um, uh, like the Patient Advocacy Foundation that can help patients get access to some patient assistance programs when they may not have that kind of robust support in the clinics. That's a great point. I should have mentioned that. Um, we, we go to some effort to connect patients with those various sources. Um, you know, I would say that for most of our patients who are receiving, say, the outpatient drugs, uh, at least for those patients with Medicare Part D, they'll generally spend through to their catastrophic level within the first one to two months, and that's already $5,100 out of pocket. And after that point, they're responsible for 5% of whatever their outpatient drug cost is with no cap, which I think right. many people fail to understand. Uh, and so I... I treat patients in the state of North Carolina and you're in Texas. For many of my patients, that, that's a very meaningful uh, amount. Um, and we have seen patients refusing therapy. So I too have patients that have chosen not to take oral oncolytics because that threshold was too high for them to cross. And so they've chosen, as a breast cancer specialist, they've chosen to take endocrine therapy alone instead of endocrine therapy plus CDK4-6 inhibition, yeah. despite the fact that the progression-free survival is about a third as long um, because the cost was too much to bear, even recognizing that eventually they would cross this catastrophic threshold and have to pay a lower out-of-pocket amount, that much was too much of a burden for them to have access to that critical therapy. Yeah. So, you know, I think that brings us to an important point where we are today, where we live in the most amazing time of therapeutic innovation, and it's the best time ever to be an oncologist. I often say it's like being an infectious disease specialist in the 30s. We've got all the good drugs. We do have to figure out how to navigate paying for them, and I'm sure that's a a struggle we'll continue to face. Absolutely. Well, you know, just at this ASCO meeting uh, we had in our plenary session the uh, randomized phase three trial showing that enzalutamide uh, can be used in castration sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and this is an important study because it provides access to a new option for patients and there are a fair number of patients in the setting. Yet, this means uh, on average about 20 months of treatment uh, with a drug that on average costs about $12,000 a month. Now, an alternative, like in your scenario in breast cancer, is four to six cycles of upfront dose ataxel, which may be more toxic in the short run, but because of the differences in coverage for intravenous versus oral oncolytics uh, is different for what the patient is facing, which means it's more important than ever for us to understand the insurance status of our patients and their financial situations so that we can help them make a choice about which of those treatments might be appropriate for them. It's a great point. Yeah. Ethan, thank you for joining me for a fantastic discussion. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.